problem. Carry on. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm out of it right now. So thank you, Sean. <laughs> Um, yeah, so great representation from Nigeria. Excited about that. Um, he mentioned the SDG tracker, which I hadn't heard of. And it's very similar to the, and I think Cassie, you had probably mentioned it and I just hadn't registered it. Um, I had just been using the, the UN SDG page and it's very similar, but it's, um, I guess a, sl a slightly different design. I don't know. Cassie, do you want to talk about the difference between that and the <laughs> are you familiar with sdg yes, tracker I, I am i i think i probably dropped it in in um a link like at some point um yeah so sdg tracker is a initiative from our world in data which is like oxford uh internet institute and probably other departments like partnership type of thing okay great um so mm -hmm. basically my understanding is the dpg alliance has a team of reviewers and they use the sdg tracker to go in and manually review um a, each project that they're that that applies to be um a digital public good and that's the very the very first requirement in their list of like 12 requirements is it has to meet and be highly relevant to one or more SDGs is the the, the words. Um, so I really like that. Um, that cleared cleared up a lot for me um, when I was looking at the uh, p5.js tool. There were a lot of choices that I could make, and it was like, well, it could meet this, you know. But I think the highly relevant really clarifies to me. Okay, you know. This is the space that it's really focusing on. Okay, that's the SDG that it is highly relevant, you know, to, to meeting. Not some of these others that maybe it could be, you could make a case, but it's not clear. So it sort of gets rid of some of the gray area and and helps make things a little bit more black and white. Um, so is the, is the Venn diagram that there are digital public goods in this big circle and within that big circle, there are projects that touch SDGs? Um, wait, say I'm, that again. I'm trying. Yeah, it's hard without a visual. So, DPG seems like a more inclusive term. That you know, so something could be a digital public good without being uh, related to uh, the SPGs, the strategic. Uh, no, um, a DPG. A requirement of being a DPG is that it it is highly relevant to one or more DPG. Okay. SDG. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It's acronym hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's like one of the, the critical requirements. Okay. And I think Cassie's handed it up. Go ahead, Cassie. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. This is exactly what David said. Um, yeah. Do people like know about DPG, like what it is, that kind of thing? Um, so it's a registry of open source projects that's uh, meant to be, it, it stands for digital public goods. And then say like, you know, so it's a, what is it like a double meaning kind of thing, public goods, as in it is like good for the public and then, and then um, goods like as things at the same time. Um, and then how they evaluate whether something a project is actually for good is just this narrative element on how your project is contributing to SDG. So yeah, um, yeah. So there's like a couple of requirements to be a DPG, which is like it has to be on open source. It has to you have to like fill out this narrative uh, element how your project is contributing to something good. That's and then what they mean by something good is that where it contributes to one of the SDGs. And then I think there's like a couple of other ones that they added in, um, as in like is this uh following all the like laws and like jurisdictions such as like data protection sort of thing. Yeah, do no harm, things like that. Um yeah, I, it has it has yeah. a clear list of, of requirements. Mm -hmm. Um 
I so, can, I can see, I can see it occurring where when we're communicating about a DPG list outside of the context of the UN SDGs, that people will enumerate digital public goods that are not related to UN SDGs. And so I think there's some small risk of confusion because the term digital public good is more broadly used. Not just like, I don't think we have to solve that right now. I just, and I think it's probably obvious to all of us, but just mentioning it. I think we have that problem all over the place of defining things well. <laughs> um, I agree with you. I, I'm still learning um, what the DPGs, you know, are. The, my understanding is there's not very many of them. I think their registry has like 200 um, listed. So I think that's, you know, this is like we're in the beginning of helping define what these things are. And um, and the, the way they do the SDG is fairly minimal. So, I, I mean, I don't think they see us as competition, and I certainly don't want us to be competition. I think we can help um, figure out the standards for their review team um, to make it to make it easier because um, it's it's very much you know they sort of they pick the SDG um, and they look at the SDG tracker to understand the indicators and then they write a sentence of how it meets you know these SDGs and it's okay. a very a very you know, short sentence and, and it's probably, it might be enough. Um, so, you know, we can, we can figure that out, but, but I think we can help define that those standards and, and make sure it's meeting it and, you know, all the different metrics challenges. <laughs> um, the other thing I'll point out is that was important to me to learn is DPGs are different from DPIs. Cassie, do you want to keep talking or did you have something? Uh, sorry, I, I did notice that my hand is up. Um, Maybe I could add one more thing that's critically different from DPG list from other like list type of thing. Um, so DPGs, at least like how it's been shaped so far, and I was like involved like in and out, involved like since like two thousand nineteen from them. Um, it's the registry. It's very product focused because like how it was initially imagined was that it would have like a like a list of uh, open source uh, but really focused on free solutions that um, organizations or now governments with not so much uh, money could like go and like take it and use it and then like a, a lot of these people are not exactly um, like software developers you know, they're like uh, program managers, like administrators. So they were often looking for like product. So things that are in there are like DHIS2. Like, I think that's like the biggest like flagship thing. Um, Do people know what DHIS2 is? So it's, uh yeah, so, so, so people like in my word, like all knows what it is, but then like, it's a kind of niche thing. Um, I what does it stand for district health information system so it's it's uh where people can create like vaccine registry for example at a very large scale um and then i think it's also important to note a lot of this products on the pg list especially like a more mature or flagship ones um sort of like has a this like dual licensing type of situation where they offer the SaaS version and then that's the case for everything that's, um, well, most of the mature products that's up there that like people will recognize, like ODK, um, Kobo, DHIS2, like all of those things. So I think that's kind of different as, and, and then like a lot of this like district health, health information system could be contributing to multiple SDGs, like obviously the health one, but then I could be, uh, keeping track of like HPV vaccine rollout, then I am contributing to something about like women's uh, rights and all that. Like I could be doing this for like a, what is it, like a newborn um, like mandatory vaccination. Then this is all about like child health. Like so, and SDGs are sort of measured at that level. Um, 
So I think that's also really important to think of. Like a lot of items on these registries are full on like product that they also offer as a SaaS where people pay. Thanks, Cassie. Yeah, the other thing that um that the sorry that um they made clear to me was the difference between DPGs and DPIs. Um and digital public infrastructure is is broader. You know, that's that's Python, Jupyter Notebook, Postgres, it's the Linux, <laughs> Apache, you know, it's the big things. Um and so they're not, even though there's they can support SDGs, obviously. They're not like specifically um, addressing them, their their infrastructure. So they're the GBGs are not classifying those, um, and I don't th think we want to get in the business of classifying those either. My thought was that if we ever get to a state where we have a software bill of materials um, standards, that the that would be the way. You know, you could see all these tools that were classified as digital public goods. Um, would their S bombs would show that they're relying on Python or these other tools, and then they would those tools would get credit for for supporting it, you know, sort of a flow down version. If that makes any sense. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I have a link to the registry. Um, I have a link to the the wiki, which talks about some of the the different standards and. Um, yeah, um, talking to, um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, <clears throat> um, talking to Balaji, he um, read through, he was gracious enough to read through our um, documents and he had some opinions. And honestly, I get a little bit confused <laughs> about this, but um, let me see, I'm moving my thing all around. <clears throat> yeah, so he liked our goal, develop a framework, and I told him it might not be framework, it might be more uh, a lighter, we had a debate about the word framework. I think the goal one is like the only goal we got to last week. Um, so maybe we can talk to that um, after this. Um, but he liked goal one, two, and six. Um, and then I think he had some confusion about the others or was just worried maybe about them being duplicative. Um, and then he liked actions five and six. Um, so just to keep that in mind, um, you know, we're, as we're trying to dedupe and, and work together. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Do I have any other points on that? Um, they're going to try to join our working group when they can. And um, we're going to try to schedule a meeting with their review team so that they can talk us through how they do the reviews, um, specifically to determine how how they determine if, if it is an SDG or not. Um, so I think that will be really helpful in, in, in how we do our work <clears throat> and what they can, what, how we can help them. Any questions? Ugh. Um, Ruth, do you happen to be online? Ruth was traveling, so she was not sure she was going to be able to make it. She added the next bullet about identifying chaos, um, existing metrics that are connected with SDGs. Um, Sean, do you have any thoughts on that? Being a chaos rep? I mean, I think, I think if to some, I mean, we're, so we're trying to achieve these um, goals, these um, strategic development goals. And part of what we need to do is think about what does it look like when a project is healthy in this context, right? Because we're, we're concerned about community health. And you know, obviously, chaos has a, a lot of metrics that get at community health. And, and like I've said i'll be able to be in this meeting more regularly after my semester's over and i stop teaching in the next hour but i think um as, as we go through this we we need to sort of be thinking about if healthiness 
looks different in this context than it may in, for for example, a corporatized open source context or an open source uh, research software context. Um, and I and I think what I'm what I really mean is, let's just use a very simple example of the number of commits and how frequently they occur indicates that a project continues to be maintained. What thresholds are appropriate for projects that we regard as digital public goods and that address a strategic development goal? I think that that will be where I think this group will do some work to figure out what what is the right threshold for helping a project or providing suggestions or otherwise perhaps judging that, okay, this, this project seems to be doing fine. Um, and so I think that that nuance, that judgment is where is one of the places this this group will be important for the sort of useful application of chaos metrics. Does that make sense? Yeah, I really like that. Um, I think I think you guys have done a lot of really good work there. And I know being in the academic world where you have research projects that could be addressing an SDG and be great, but then the funding runs out and it doesn't, you know, the maintainer gets a job and it's done. Um, right. That doesn't, we don't want to, um, we need to ha manage that. We need to have some strategy for. Yeah. And I don't know in this, in this context of the projects, projects we're looking at here, what, if there are sort of fallow periods where there isn't activity and that's okay, or, or if it is more similar to corporatized contexts where if there's no commits for three months, mm -hmm. we start to get concerned. Um, and I, I suspect, I mean, I, I don't know who the maintainers are for some of these projects that can help us kind of understand what's, what cyclical characteristics the, the UN SDG related projects might have. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if all, I don't know if like we're a good representation of the folks that we need to talk with, or if there are other folks who are direct maintainers of some of these projects that we might want to have conversations with. I'm learning. Right. Or maybe it's, we classify them in different bins, you know, and something is, is, is more stable, you know, because it, it has a foundation backing it or it has, you know, some. Yeah. And, and we can, you know, we can certainly apply at chaos metrics using the different tools that we have to, you know, take a list of repositories that are in the DPG group and sort of just describe them. Here are the commit rates, here are the number of contributors and, you know, that's something with a given a list of projects, that's something that maybe would be useful. I don't know if it is now or if we're ready for that or if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. It sounds like from Cassie's description of the projects that they're very mature. Um, and, and so maybe they're not, they're not the ones we have to worry about, but the new ones that we might be adding or enabling people to add might be higher risk. Yeah. Does, yeah. does this, do we have a list of the SDG projects somewhere? I mean, I know they're on the websites, but. Um, that DPG, that registry is the list of all the projects. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Could I speak like a uh, response? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, so there's a couple points and I really do think Sean is making an like excellent point. I think one of it is that you uh, sort of alluded alluded in the chat. Um, so all the projects that contribute to SDG are not all part of the, the DPG registry, right? So DPG registry is not a, a representation of all the projects that may contribute to SDGs or do something good, right? I think that's the first one distinction to think about. Um, and then maybe this is the scope, right? Like starting with like uh, starting to um, look at the projects that's already part of the digital public goods registry is sort of an easy start because someone had already kind of curated that, right? Um, yeah, but just like, let's be mindful. That's not the whole word. Um, and then another thing is that a lot of the project maturity there, it's mixed. Um, 
I am fairly sure all of them have a entity behind it. Like that entity is either an organization um, or a foundation or it's a spin up of a company that like some people had like set up. Um, and then another interesting thing is where I like spoke to, let's say like maintainer, but these are usually like uh, sellers like to me, right? Like because they're trying to sell their product to organizations that I work in, right? Like uh, doesn't WHO need a vaccine registry, you know? <laughs> Don't you need a CRM for like uh, community health workers? Right. Like, so, so usually I meet them in, uh, in a, like a sales context, so to say, um, and then they are open source, but I think what's really also unique is that a lot of them don't accept contributions. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of them, yeah. what, what did you say at the end? I missed that. A lot accept like a code contribution. That, oh, that's really? like one, yeah, that, that's like something that I really wanted to do like research on or like kind of come up with the right way to evaluate this as in like that's kind of the phenomena that I have observed. And then um, when I try to like fork it and just run it when I for like the, the organizations that I work in as in it's open source, I know enough to do it. Uh, the documentations are usually really terrible um that's like, open source in general but <laughs> uh, but here it's especially more terrible okay okay yeah <laughs> and and then and then also the the a lot of times the quality really varies like i'm not going to name but some of the most popular projects there it's it has like a what like 12 different languages because they were accepting contribution from every like Jack and Jill, like uh, submitting, and then you know, then it's like, well, I I cannot really like use this for any production grade, uh, data collection. Yeah. So, so then, then it's like, oh, then then you have to use our SAS version of it if you want to use this. So so, so that's kind of how it um is. Where I I do think like just that was a bit of a tangent, but uh, Sean's point about. Maybe there needs to be a different way to measure the health of so-called uh, public good contributing open source projects differently. So when you say there are projects that don't accept code contributions, my first thought is there are many valid examples in the open source world. And my favorite example is Twitter Bootstrap, where there's like six people who have maintained it over time. It's very popular. Um, and they generally don't accept outside contributions, even though it's an open source project. And that sort of closed environment is quite valid. It's just a different leadership or governance model. The other, when you talk about contractors, and I'm going to put Remy on the spot, sorry, that sounds very similar to the kinds of things that happen when a contractor is employed by like the U.S. government or a state government to build a project. They're required to open source it. But they don't really accept outside contributions because they haven't honestly learned how to do that. Um, is that kind of the scenario in, in these ones that don't accept outside contributions, do you think? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I actually didn't know that was happening elsewhere too, but that's exactly what's yeah. happening here. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is where governments and NGOs have very similar kinds of challenges where you know you're going to achieve you're going to obtain some resources to accomplish a thing that includes software and you're going to make them open source it but the way these organizations typically work is not in an open source way so there's yeah. like a, a development or a maturity like a thing happening yeah. there and it's a requirement from the funder usually that it should be open source so it's just like oh well if it's on git like if it's on github and gitlab and has some kind of osi approved license then it's an open source right like so it's yeah. not really in a usable state of open yeah source. yeah um yeah, remy made a point in chat too that you know once the contract is up there may be nobody to maintain it <laughs> who understands yeah. how it works. And for this kind of projects, uh, it's a bit worse because the main um, users or the audience are very, very not tech savvy. 
yeah like, yeah 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 so so people like don't know the difference or um you know it's like well it's open source like so it must be good why aren't we using it I say, no it's a liability that if we use this because like it's uh <laughs> in a not a really good state like i don't feel safe using it like uh, yeah yeah i think they should write that like on readme like this big like we didn't maintain this for seven years like yeah yeah no, th thank you. I hate to, I'm sorry if I diverted the conversation. I just had these natural curiosities. No, I think that's really valuable. Um, I'm sort of a corporate activist and very much distrustful of corporations, you know, doing greenwashing and, you know, selling to you um, <laughs> all the time. And everybody's going to try to game the system. And so... I'm excited that we're working closely with DPG Alliance and they're doing the auditing and they do a yearly review of every project. So, you know, some, in some ways they'll, they'll help correct for those projects. Hopefully, you know, if we help bring in some of the chaos metrics and they see that there's been no activity for a year, you know, they, they maybe, hopefully they'll bring that into their evaluation. I don't really want to be in the auditing business, but I do want to enable the auditors to find the, the bad citizens and and you know get them out um and and keep in the the good citizens so i think that's a challenging part of our job that's very interesting to me and just to to close one loop in the conversation i think i heard that there are projects that are contributing to sdgs that are not listed in the registry did i understand that correctly and so if that's the case do we have a place that we are i don't know do we have like a shadow registry for those projects or how do how do we know which ones they are in the vast universe of open source so i think that's a big part of our mission that was the open question from the ospos for good conference was how we know open source software is contributing to sdgs how do we find that out how do we track it so we're Thanks to DPG Alliance, you know, they've done some good work and we're ahead of where I thought we were. Um, and I think Git, I know GitHub, you know, we, I demoed on the first day, they have some set of, of projects that they've highlighted are addressing. And I don't know their metrics or how they're determining that. Perhaps they're using the DPG Alliance, perhaps it's a subset, perhaps it's different projects, I don't know. Um, so we can figure out, you know, what are they doing? What's DPG Alliance doing? Um, and help create the standards so that everybody's doing it in an agreed upon way that, you know, is, is, is good. <laughs> Go ahead, Remy. So I would offer that, um, and this is just, you know, my opinion as a person, uh, that if a project has not reached the point of maturity where they are not applying to be part of the registry, then that is also a signal of whether or not they're contributing to the SDGs. I think that self-selection is a really important part of open source community and allowing people to self-select into that group is probably going to give us better signal than trying to pre-select somebody who we think is part of that group but hasn't identified as such. So I would offer that up. But I would also say that like identifying candidate repositories for people who might want to join the registry is still a useful activity because not everyone knows what a DPG is and not everyone who's doing open source work knows that the SDGs are a thing. So I think there is a, a knowledge gap and a promotion gap for sure. But I also think that it's important to uh, have self-selection be an important gate that that we utilize when we're collecting these kinds of metrics. I think that's interesting. You were reading my mind a little bit because in a, well, you were reading it, but you weren't reading it right. <laughs> I was thinking um, not that at all. Um, I, I think that's great. I really value that sentiment. Um, I like organic growth. And I think that's like a, a way that, you know, you're not putting somebody that you're not nominating a project that you think is great where the maintainers like burnt out and ready to, to abandon ship and you just don't know. Um, but I also love that the DGBG Alliance has this mechanism where you can nominate a project. Um, and I feel like 
like the p5.js to me is a great project that should be in there um they have they have sustainability they have a foundation backing them um they're doing great work to address um at least sdg4 and and probably some others um so and and i've talked to them so like you know i we could find projects like that and work with their maintainers where we could use them almost as prototypes to to work through the process and figure out you know what makes sense and and you know work through the dpg alliance process of nominating them um and that could be one benefit of our group is that we're just we're just finding projects that we know about and you know getting them in the recognition that they deserve and doing helping guide them through the work and in that process we can learn you know about these projects and and what are the different facets that we we should be aware of and that, that we can help the review team, you know, measure. Does that sound like a good idea or a bad idea? I don't know. I like to just do things sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking if maybe a place like, I would like to see if we can provide some descriptive information um, using chaos metrics and, and maybe, and so I worry if I only use the digital public goods registry, I will not, uh, find all of the things that are important for a particular SDG. And so maybe, maybe, I don't know. If, so, you know, the way I think about this is maybe there's one SDG that we can pull from the registry and then folks might know about other projects that are not in the registry that are important. And we could provide some, you know, just to illustrate what we could possibly do, provide some descriptive statistics of that landscape, just in the case of one SDG that's just an idea. I don't want to get, I, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit perhaps, but I'm just thinking about what could I contribute to this group that might be useful. Go ahead, Remy. So I, I think that's a useful approach. Um, going back to an earlier comment that you made uh, and sort of wrapping that into this, I think that one of the approaches that we have taken for understanding the open source ecosystem in the federal government, at least in our agency, is a maturity model approach. So different projects will have different levels of maturity and different goals. And I think that if we have some kind of maturity model that we can point to and say, like, these projects do address these goals based on these identifiers or these self-selection or this metadata, but they are at a maturity level and here's a spectrum of maturity and the most mature projects are the ones that are in the registry and they're out there and that's the goal that you want to be driving towards and then other ones might be earlier in their journey but are organized in a way to meet the goals so by having a maturity model like you were saying earlier like different projects will have different goals and they'll be at different points in their journey and then the metrics can feed into those levels and help you quantify and qualify like where they are on that path. If that that's an approach we've taken, I don't know if that would map entirely smoothly to this space, but um, it's it's been uh, one we've been exploring here at our agency. I really like that. Cassie, do you know if the DPG Alliance has um, like limits in any way? Like, it seems like it's maybe healthcare focused. Is it meant to stay that way or do they want to no, open it up? They, they don't have limits, um, which could be an issue. I mean, it's not really an issue. No, they don't have any focus or limit. It's just that it's open source and um, have a narrative, con some sort of contribution to SDG. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, Remy, I, I like, I, I, I like what you're saying. Um, that enables like the research projects to have a path forward and, and anything that that you know isn't there yet or is even just an idea to give them a path um and yeah maybe they could become an sdg project that's maturity level one <laughs> you know and it's just starting and you know that it's not something to rely on yet but you know but if you want to do research in that area or support that you know at that level, whatever that level might be, I don't quite know. Um, you know, that's a place to look. Um, and maybe that wouldn't be in the GPG Alliance um, registry yet. Um, or maybe it would. Um, 
and it would be just defined, you know, maybe they'd have categories or something. Um, uh, or, you know, maybe that's, that could be in our, we could manage that separately. Um, or I don't even know that we need to manage it. We just need to enable others to manage it. You know, maybe Jonathan Stark can figure, <laughs> figure all that out with his mapping tools. Um, and we just have to, to, to enable, enable him to have the, the resources to do the API queries and, and sort on the right filters, et cetera. John, did you drop off? Um, cause I hear Steer had some questions about what you were saying. Sorry. I had to jump out of the classroom. I was borrowing. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm curious more about like what the, the, what you mean about the descriptions? Well, uh, you know, we, uh, like I said, we, you know, as we all know, there are one, there are like 80 some chaos metrics. Um, and we have ways of sort of showing you the state of the world over the last say two years on all of those metrics. So they could provide a descriptive foundation for activity levels, community engagement levels, things that are important for understanding the maturity really as Remy's discussed it. And I, I think Remy's group actually has some things that are, I would call them adjacent to chaos metrics that try to get to uh, some of these uh, project maturity levels. And really, so it's, I say descriptive because I think it's important that, you know, chaos doesn't come in and like, here, here are some metrics and we're here to help you. It's more like, here's, here's a description. These, these aren't diagnostic in any way, because we don't honestly understand that space. We don't understand the space that each SDG might be in right now. And so I, I think it's important not to approach it in the same way as if we know what the thresholds are for some of these SDG related projects, because I think we truly, we don't know, but I think it's also helpful to see just that description. Here's what it looks like chaos metrics wise. Okay. That sounds great. Do we have um, an SDG that you'd want to start with? You, you said you just want to like tackle one at first, right? Yeah. I mean, I think if uh, this group directed me towards one, I would start me my, myself. I would possibly start with that one. I would look at the digital registry and then I might inquire if anyone's aware of other repositories that are important for that SDG that are not in the registry. Oh, and I didn't just, mean a repository. I meant an SDG, one of the 17. Oh, I, was it I would look at specific or was it going to be across more generic? Yeah. yeah, I would look to this group to tell me where to start. You know, it would, you know, an SDG that folks think would be, you know, a good exemplar for providing chaos metrics. I expect some of them have established active projects and others may not, um, for example. Okay. Um, and we don't need to decide that today as we're running out of time, but. Oh, right. We are. Wow. Time got away from me. <laughs> um, okay. Well, ah, good conversation. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't keep track better. Um, yeah. So go ahead. Let's just... has her hand up. Um... Hey, just before we um, adjourn, uh, I just want to bring up, we have a holiday schedule across chaos which the way this meeting falls would mean that this is the last meeting of the year. Um, and I hate to, you know, chop off the, the momentum that you all have. So if you would right? like, to, yeah, because the next, next meeting would be the week of 25th, which is oh, Thanksgiving. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep and then the next, the next week, week. The mm -hmm. so if you want, if this group wants to keep the December 11th meeting, I can absolutely put it back on the calendar. If you want to just take a break until the first of the year, that's also valid. Just let me know what you want to do and I will do it. Um, let's let people vote. All in favor of keeping the meeting for December 11th. I'm only looking at pictures. <laughs> I don't know who's online. Um, I'm neutral. Okay. I will follow the wishes of the rest of the group. Um, I agree with 
trying to keep the momentum. So we'll, we'll put it, I'm available that day. So we'll, we'll put it, um, keep it. And if people are off then no, no worries. Um, and you know, we have the GitHub now, so please continue the conversation via the GitHub with, with any, raise any issues. Remy's already put some issues in there. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, we'll tr try to be active there and capture some of these conversations. Um, fantastic. Um, there's the community survey that, that they listed. So please take that if you're able to. Um, oh, and the ChaosCon CFP. And that's going to be in Belgium, right? That's yes, right. Yes, before FOSDEM. So it's on January 30th. It's that Thursday before okay. FOSDEM. I don't think I'm going to be able to go to that. Unfortunately, I was kind of excited about maybe doing something there. Next okay, time. so I'll put the meeting back on the calendar for December 11th then. Okay, great. Thanks. Any last words from anybody? Hey, David, one quick question. I Go ahead. remember talking, maybe it was to you at FOSSI or it might have been to someone else in the UNSDG group. Uh, there are mechanisms in corporations that have programs to either donate time or money for volunteer hours if they're nonprofit. And I know that there is an arm in the UNSDG group that may actually be a 501c3. It doesn't work for a trade association, a C6, but if there's a C3 organization, that is something that I know I could get integrated into our volunteer program that might help support various UNSDG initiatives either through volunteer hours of working on a specific program that's part of what uh, an open source project that is amenable to one of those goals or through volunteer dollars we earn when we volunteer for things and then you can donate that to a C3 organization in the data bank. So I just wanted to throw that out there and I'm guessing that my company isn't the only one that does that type of thing. I don't know if the DPG Alliance, you know, makes that clear. I'm sure. I'm not sure, um, especially after talking to Cassie, <laughs> if any of those um, open source projects are managed by by nonprofit um, organizations or not. Well, it doesn't, if it's if it's the UN SDG that has an arm that is a 501c3 and they are saying, hey, we would love people to contribute volunteer hours to work on X project that is amenable to this goal we're trying to achieve, then that might be a way to funnel either the volunteer hours or potentially if we volunteer with other things that are not UNSDG but have money, it could go into the 501c3 UNSDG group. Um, I don't know. I'll have to talk to Michael Downey about that. Yeah, I'm not sure about the entity of the DPG, but it's not a UN agency or any of that. Um, yeah, I don't know if it would work then. I, I just it was maybe it was Michael Downey I was talking to at Fossi about this, and it was just it's a mechanism that I know I have to that for projects that are sponsored or that are owned by a 501c3 and there aren't many of them but for instance the open source initiative is a 501c3 organization so i can do volunteer hours for them and i can earn volunteer dollars and then i can donate those volunteer dollars back to osi if i so choose that's just one example and i thought if there was something similar with the unsdg maybe that would be another mechanism to encourage corporate engagement I think a, that's a great idea. Um, I know my my old company had a lot of people that were really excited to do that kind of work and and looking for that kind of avenue. Um, so yeah, I'll follow up with Michael and see. Oh, yeah, just drop the good first issues uh, link. I I'm sure people had brought this up in this uh, group before. Um, but that sort of GitHub's initiative of putting together um like let's say like dpg projects 
uh, the PGA listed projects that um are that people can contribute to. So but Excellent, I, thank you. But I don't think it links to any of uh like uh donation hours or like sort of thing. Yeah, volunteer hours or that sort of thing. Okay, thanks for bringing that up, Ria. That's that's a good idea. Um, yeah, ways to get more people working on the SDGs. Uh, I encourage that. <laughs> um, w one possible way for that is, I don't. We don't have any of the structure right now. I don't know what chaos is format is. Um, but we could, we could be involved in the process. You know, a little bit of helping to map out which of these projects are SDGs and and. And so there could be work there, and perhaps that could be done under Chaos or some other organization that isn't a nonprofit. Chaos is a five hundred one c six since it's under the Linux Foundation, so it's not okay amenable to this particular idea. I tried already. Okay, <laughs> I see. <laughs> Sorry, Elizabeth. <laughs> One step behind you. All right. Um, well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your time. Great discussion again. Um, I look forward to seeing as many of you as are available on December 11th. Excellent. Take care. Bye.
<laughs> hey, Angela. How you doing? Yeah. I'm sorry. I have bronchitis. Sorry. Oh. Zero fun. Well, it's kind of nice to have a sick day, to be honest. You're working on a sick day? <laughs> yeah. Doesn't sound like you took a sick day. Well, I've been sick since like this weekend. And so I took Monday and Tuesday off. And I worked kind of like the meetings that I wanted to go to. And then I didn't go to the meetings I didn't want to go to. And I watched some Netflix. <laughs> so it was kind of all right. Um, it seems like you're not very good at being sick because Netflix all day with a blankie is really what you're supposed to do. I did a lot of Netflix with a blankie and soup. And my daughter is so sweet. She's like, Daddy, here's my pine cone stuffy. And here's a little book for you to read. And here's some other stuff. And she's like, oh, my gosh. That's adorable. And I'm give you a hug, but not a kiss because you're sick. <laughs> oh, that is too cute. And then, and then she's terrorizing my wife. Like, <laughs> give me my treat. I want my sweet treat. <laughs> oh, she's yes so sweet to me and so mean to, to my wife they, they know they know they know how to play the parents yeah they do so that's good also my wife has been care, care, covering for me the whole time and so you know she's on does your little go to she's three right she's just turned four she just turned four does she pre-k She's Montessori school. Yeah. Ah, uh, Montessori. That's good. Yeah, I wish we would have done that. Uh, we sent our kid out to like, well, I shouldn't be recording this right. We sent him to a This pre-K. is being recorded, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we sent him to a pre-K affiliated to, with an institution that is largely prestigious. But that particular program should maybe be reevaluated. Oh. <laughs> Say like that. As like all our entire educational system, in my opinion. Really? <laughs> Do you think we're doing a good job? Look at what we just did. <laughs> Clearly, people are not being educated. I worry about that. <laughs> yeah, I worry about that. But then I look at like the, I don't, this has been big lately, but it's called Project Alpha. And it's um, AI. AI directed, AI directed learning. So you do essentially like AI facilitated sessions for two hours and it's the hardcore like addition, subtraction, multiplication, reading, and you do all of that with an AI and a facilitator. So it's you, it's very individualized. And then you do two hours of projects So very hands-on, like science experiments, math in like puzzles and different kinds of presentations. And then two hours of like just what's supposed to be fun activities, but they can also be service activities. And I'm interested in this model, um, but I think that I think learning is something that's a highly engaged activity. And I do worry about the engagement when you're engaging with a bot, Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm worried about what that, what that communicates, but I feel I'm not like, so worried about that. I mean, you humans know. can be tricked. Um, I, I can, I can uh, anthropomorphize anything. So for sure, a bot, I can fall in. I mean, I think you can fall in love with them and everything. So I don't think they won't be engaged, but they won't be engaged with people, real people, like any time they're spending with it, with their phones, et cetera. But theoretically, that model could be good. I like hands-on learning. I think that's more of that. Yeah, but I feel like if we're going to redo education, like it's going to involve a lot more AI. And I'm just curious about what that looks like. Ugh, yeah, I guess. That's not exactly the direction I was hoping to focus on. Have you heard of the um, Don't Waste Students Work TED Talk or Movement? Uh-uh. That's what I want to see. Like instead of us repeating the same math homework and the same problems 
over and over and over again. We work on real problems because Lord knows we have enough of them. <laughs> and we have students like solving real problems, doing real research for their assignments. It's a lot more work on the faculty or the teachers. Oh, yeah. But I think once you got it started, it could be amazing. Yeah. Practical in my world seems to work. I'm struggling with like the fact that I live in Texas and the science curriculum is crap. And so as a, as a parent, I'm like, hey, school district, you are doing amazing. I love you. But have you do you know that you can have all these people inside your classroom to talk about like different things like computer science or or there's like bugs that they'll bring. And I'm like, in addition to that, there are all these curriculum resources that are just there if you want them. And they're like, oh, I'm like, I'm sorry, but when no one I mean, four first graders, four second graders participated in the science fair last year. And like you're in a district where 80% of the parents are UT Austin faculty. So I don't get it. <laughs> if that's the like if, if you understanding that it would be signed like you're you're doing applied learning in set like a context. I mean, I don't I don't think we're remotely there. I agree. All right, I'm just putting in the TED talk, which I just when I launch YouTube, it just automatically launches. So that was that nice, exciting, suspensive sounds as a TED talk. Drama music. Can I make sure everyone can hear me? I'm Yep. Yeah. Hi, sorry. I'm having a bit of a little bit of a crisis. I'm due to speak like at an event and my computer started updating a half an hour ago and it's on 29 percent. So oh, no. Your computer. And I'm like, ah, ah, <laughs> why did do I have do a, <laughs> now, do you have a charger? Time. Say again. Do your charger? It's not my it's not my charger. It's the it's so it's it, it, the computer I usually use has just decided to. But the lights are are logged into the the, the are plugged into the USB thing because I don't have enough USB plugs, and then it keeps going on and off. <laughs> anyway, no, never mind. Sorry, it's it's you it's look a, great, Claire. You look thank great. You. You look great. That's, that's that's for that's for events. That's for <laughs> make an effort. Make an effort. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad I'm glad you can hear me. That at least my backup works. Yep. Well, apparently, like, did you see we have a digital, like, a, an AI bot in our meeting? So, like, maybe that person could just... Could just, like, do it for me. I mean, or oh, can you know? AI bot, can you... <laughs> what, what can you do to help? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ask it. I, I'm telling you, my kid has full-on conversations with AI bots. You're right. They can anthropomorph anthropomorphize anything, but... It's true. It's true. It's true. Um. But but anyway, but yeah, so are are we but but so I do have to leave early. I'm sorry but for from this meeting, but um to Well but... it looks like we might not be are we having this meeting? Well, I was I was very keen to to see what y'all thought about this global innovation index, which has been bothering me from the Irish perspective. If um if 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 I could share some of the challenges there and see what people are thinking about from a measurement perspective, I would appreciate it. Yes. Please. Okay, so take it away. Let, so I, I shared this in the Slack channel, so I, I'm just going to cut and paste it into the notes. Are, are you? Have you all got the, the notes document? Uh, let me see. Uh, let me see. I've got the, the here is the, whoops. This, this, in fact, you'd be glad to know, Angela, was in fact the output of a chat GPT query on here's the Global Innovation Index. Here's our positioning paper for the Open Forum for Research. Can you tell me how they would fit together to, to, to create a justification? So this this was actually what ChatGPT came up with. Um, so let me. So share. I want to help with the research. I mean, I have a PhD. I'm a legit researcher, and I'm a social scientist, which gives me a set of special set of quantitative and qualitative skills. So let me know how to help with the research. Let me just put that on the table. It's being recorded, and this AI bot got it. So <laughs> I love it. There you go for perp perpetuity. Now that's that's there. Now let me just double check because we're not October. Yeah. I'm not able to even edit this now in this stupid machine. My spare machine is not one that I'm used to using. So hold on now. Keyboard's all wonky. Which is why it's not my real machine. So we are on November 13th. And I'm going to keep keep the pumpkin just because. 
I'm on that. This is the World Intellectual Property Organization. This is their this is their document. And um uh I'm just putting in this from from the from the Slack just so we can know what we're talking about. And I am just going to share you the document link here. And let me let me tell you the background. So basically in Ireland, um an awful lot of our the basically there's been a new organization set up. Uh, called Research Ireland, tagged Ireland, um, tagged Air in, in Irish. <clears throat> and it's, um, we used to have Science Foundation Ireland and the Irish Research Council and all the funding for all the researchers in Ireland, everyone that's funded from the States, every single one of them is funded through this mechanism where the money comes down through SFI or Irish Research Council. And it had been divvied up into a number of research centres. I think there were 12 of them. Lero, who I'm associated with, it is one of them. And uh, they have decided to, they, the the minister, the then minister for higher education, who is now our essentially prime minister, our Taoiseach, but our prime minister, um, uh, he wrote this Impact 2030 strategy document, which is basically how Ireland's research strategy is now going to position us as an innovation hub, you know, the usual, every country wants to be an innovation hub for everything. <laughs> so he wrote this document, um, and it has caused the start, the, the the creation of this new entity called Research Ireland, which has consumed or subsumed into it all the other uh, funding agencies. So now it's the one funding agency that hopefully will rule them all. And it is going to determine how all the research euros in Ireland are spent and are allocated and spent across the whole research um, uh, landscape. Fantastic. Very disruptive, I would say, because there's going to be a change in the research centers. They've put out a new call. Um, some of the research centers that exist right now, I think there's 12 today. I think that's going to be synthesized into maybe six. They're probably going to have very specific kind of industry focuses. That seems mm -hmm. to be the gist of the document. But within the document, they call out, this is how we're going to measure Ireland's innovation capacity in the future. And they refer to multiple occasions, this Global Innovation Index. Now, when I saw this, I was like, well, I wonder what the Global Innovation Index says about potentially open source outputs, for example, because the same minister, now Taoiseach, um, also was the person who fun founded, funded and founded the National Open Research Forum. So it's not that he doesn't understand that open research is a thing, that open source software is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so Ireland is signed up to that as commitment as well. But the document doesn't really refer to open source at all. Unsurprisingly, most of these don't. Mm -hmm. um, and I really my my question to all of us is basically thinking about these kinds of global indexes that or indices that come from these um, organizations, in this case, the World Patent Organization. How can open source be factored into that index? That's so what I wanted to see is if there's a way for us not to position this is why open source is great in its own little thing, but this is why open source is relevant in the context of this global innovation index. Because if you want to go higher on the index, here is how our open source efforts could apply to that. And of course, so 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 that was what that was where I started. And then I I put it into ChatGPT to say, tell me how. And uh, and it did the the the, the purple thing, it's coming up as purple for me, uh, that I just cut and paste into the document which is around, they they looked at the areas that the Global Innovation Index looks at, for example, knowledge creation, technological development, infrastructure and ICT access, human capital and research, business sophistication and knowledge absorption, and institutional support and governance. And it kind of looked at all of those, these are the areas that they call out in the report, and then it suggested these, these topical areas where open source might apply. So the two questions I have are number one, are they the right categories, for example, or are there maybe others? And number two, if these are the right categories, is anyone measuring anything? Like, is, are there any measurements in place that I could that I could use beyond just saying, you know, here's a case study that that I am going to suggest influences this metric? But but are is anyone measuring these things? That's that's really my, my point because we we've been talking about the potential metrics here. But but I suppose this 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 is almost like an urgent ask to say, is anyone measuring these sort of things? Can we can we can we point to instances in, you know, any of your universities where where your open source efforts 
um, are actually driving these kinds of areas. That's really what I'm asking. Because then I could use that as a case study, an international case study to, to say this is why more of this should happen in Ireland. So um, I, I would need to think about all of this, but off the top of my head, um, what I would say is the, the research that you're going to meet with James about. Yes. He has looked at, it's like 50 million publications. Yes. And he's counting the number of times that open source software is mentioned. And then he narrows it down to even like, does the software have a name? Does the product have a name? So you could take that body of work and you could count the citations. I'll, you can use the GitHub repository to point it at the exact same data set that um, this World Patent Agency or whatever this or larger organization is. So he has the GitHub process to do all of that. So you could use the exact same thing and you could pull out the open source software mentions in that in that body. So that's you can do that. Um, it isn't being done, but now we have a tool that could do that. So um, I think talk to James about that because I think he I will. Would, he would be very interested in that. And I that's pretty much number one there, right? So the number of peer-reviewed research papers, technical reports that um, that open source topics can signal strong research output. So it's basically a research output that is open source and the citations of that. Is that, that how that yes. works? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the open source project contributions, I mean, um, a lot of that, the, the contributions are harder to, to track, right? But a lot of that, if you wanted to talk about, um, I, I think the discovery process that Jonathan Starr and like Michael's riffing off of, I think that there might be a way to build into that project discovery process, um, a variable that would say, um, you know, how many new contributions have been made over Michael is using a 12 to 18 month time span to kind of bootstrap the data so that we have relevant projects, projects that are active. So I think talk to Jonathan and Michael about how you might get at that second question. I do think that's a valid um, indicator that people are trying to explore. Patents and licensing, I'm not going to be an expert there, but if you can find the scholarly publications those scholarly publications are often affiliated with a patent or a license so i would have to imagine that there's some layer of research that could be done there um you might also talk to james about that and i apologize i'm not more aware of of the the ecosystem of researchers there but he he will be um can i ask just on that one in particular so so this this idea that so it, it seems to be my understanding is that there there is open source software out there that have patents related to it. I mean, this is not an uncommon thing. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, but it's not come up very often. Certainly, um, um, a lot of folks don't realize it that that this can happen. They kind of assume that all open source doesn't have any patents associated with it. D does it come up much in your field of of endeavor? Like, do you hit these like open source projects that do have patents associated with them? We have projects that come to us that ask about getting patents. Okay. So um, you might uh, you might find um, if you were to gonna and I apologize again I don't know what what everybody's environment oh, yeah. looks like but if you were to come to the University of Texas, we have a discovery to impact that would have a patent office. Uh, that patent office keeps track of whether it's a proprietary software or an open source software, but that's going to be individual organization based. You might be able to do a, like a survey of institutions and get at that through a survey. One of the things that the National Science Foundation does here in the United States, and again, this is not going to be, this may not be common across institutions in other countries, but one of the things that NSF does is they ask in their intake form about their PIs. Have you produced open source software? Um, this is a question that's on their questionnaire. They do track it um, and they track patents associated with it. But that's one funding agency in the United States that tracks both open source and licensing. I don't know if there are others though, but I know that's one here. But that's, I think that's a brilliant, that's again, it's these very specific references to say NSF do this, 
you know, why aren't we doing this in Research Ireland? Because this is now the way that people are kind of tracking this particular trend in order to have, I would assume, more information to feed into the Global Innovation Index, which is the point I would be making. It's kind of like, are we doing this? Are we even asking? If not, wouldn't it be easy to ask? That's what the NSF yeah. would you know, so, yeah, so I really love that. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll look look for that. Is, is that available? Like the, those forms are, are there. Um, I can just go check that out. Right. I can I can see yeah. what they ask for. Yeah, you can Google it. I forget. I dropped it at some point in time. If I can find it too, I'll clear, clear I'll send it yeah, to no, you. Yeah, no, no worries. Thank you. Um, but they, they have like a checklist of stuff mm -hmm. and that's on the checklist. Um, I think that in the United States, I don't know, um, and I apologize, I skipped some of these. I went to number three, infrastructure and oh, yeah. access. So open research, we, we track all of, and I, I think probably other libraries do as well, but we track all of our open education resources all of our open source publications that go out in open access journals. Um, we track all of that because it's part of us making the continued argument for, you know, public funding. Um, yeah. So we do track that. Our libraries track that. I know that. Um, other libraries would have to tell me. Mm -hmm. um, OSS skills development programs. I mean, those are OSPOs, what OSPOs are, right? So you yeah. can just look mm -hmm. at do OSPOs mm -hmm. or something like them exist. And this global OSS communities, I mean, Curious is one, right? Mm -hmm. Or will yeah. be as, as you grow. Um, I think the UN work that David's doing, I think that will end up being a global organization that cares about open source software. The digital public goods folks, I think are, are global communities along that. You might check in with OSI and see what they would consider their global network is. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, and of course okay. the spin outs are the same, right? But well, certainly in Ireland, this is something that, that that we are tracking, though I'm not sure it's being associated with OSS projects, but I think that would be a really good one. So, um, yeah. so amazingly for open source startups and spinoffs, we have like, if you look to venture capital organizations, a lot of venture capital organizations will track this, but you know who else tracks it? Is the Department of Defense in our country. Oh. A lot of Department of Defense projects are open source. Um, and they, uh, like our drone infrastructure is all open source software. Um, so our Department of Defense actually tracks that. But our DOD um, has a big R&D element to it. So I don't, again, I don't know if that would be common across countries. No, but I do think that um, it's, uh, I think it's really noteworthy because um, it, for me, that, that using that as an example, actually puts pay to any people saying, oh, you know, government people can't use open source because it's, you know, would would it be secure enough? And then you just need to say, well, look at the DOD. Do you think that they care about security? And look at them using open source. And it's a great it's a great counterpoint to anyone saying it's not really serious. And you're like, sure, it is. Here you go. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, um, so I, I love that example for that reason. It's It's a great one to highlight. Peculiar okay. asked for um, a link, a research link, if you had, I, I wasn't even tracking exactly what maybe you were talking about. Sorry, a research link? Yeah, I'm not sure what that refers to. Maybe we can get, maybe we can get more detail. It was a few minutes ago. I don't remember uh, things you were talking about, Angela, I imagine. You have more details, Peculiar? So sorry, I I think I have some network issues, so I dropped off. So as I joined, I, I was um I'm seeing from the doc that we we're discussing about the research. So I was trying to like understand uh, about the research and then maybe if there is a link that will help me read through to understand what this discussion is all about. Um as well the maxim. Um, I, did, I didn't quite get that peculiar in terms of it, was there something you were looking for still or did you get the link to the document that we're reading off? I'll, I'll just share that again. It's it's obviously not a research document, but it is um, the notes for this call, which is what I couldn't paste what we're discussing here about. OK, OK, I got that. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Good. 
I mean, in terms of like patents and things, that's something we're trying to make inroads on. Um, we're starting those conversations. Um, but honestly, I was really impressed with Trinity College Dublin in that regard, in terms of their OSPO and what they're doing. So you can use them as an example that, you know, anecdotally other US universities are looking towards because we did. <laughs> I, I really, I think their work in uh, including open source language in their um, in their license agreements and um, a lot of the like open spinoffs that they're doing are really cool. It's, I mean, it's it's the it's it's a it's a factor of the fact that they're sitting in a TTO office there, the OSPO there. Yes. Is, it's it's yeah. like that's how it that's at all how it all um, right. kind of manifested itself. But, that's uh, why I talked to them, yeah, because yeah. I was really curious yeah. about their perspective. But yeah, it's really cool stuff. Yeah, no, no, we, we, don't, don't you worry. We're rolling out John and the Trinity Ospo at every given opportunity <laughs> onto the stage. More, more of that spin out stuff. <laughs> yeah. So we have for Trinity, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. There's a lot of work here in open source in agriculture, which is um, yeah. par as part of a you know public land grant university. I there's there's been quite a lot of activity in our College of Agriculture um, and Life Sciences around like open data, you know, crop disease forecasting tools, plant pathology things, um, you know, predictive health uh, monitoring for cows, um, things like that. Um, I think that's a really interesting um, application like the the um, intersection of predictive like precision agriculture and open source is something that's happening a lot here so it might be I can um, show some stuff or send some things but yeah I, I think that's a that's something you can look into I would love that I literally so we're just about to go into a general election here mm. and last like the news item about the so I mean obviously we care a lot about cows in Ireland and literally <laughs> yesterday's news was how all the politicians are out talking to the farmers about how important they are and how important cows are and how important innovation is for cows and agriculture in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I like if we could actually tie open source into that discussion, that would be actually brilliant for Ireland. So, um, yeah, I'd really appreciate that, Alison, just to get to get yeah, we, what we make are the hottest, the hottest research open source projects in that area, coupling AI, open source, agriculture. I, yeah. I can't tell you how excited people would be here about that. Awesome. Yeah, we got a we got a internal grant for that to to work with a researcher on um, open sourcing his like crop disease algorithms. So um, we're excited about that. And then another one of our um, close agriculture collaborators is submitting a, a grant to the USDA around like open source data, um, data infrastructure development database stuff. So that'd be amazing. I'll send you I'm some, maybe to. some just, articles. Just News even things. exactly that I yeah. can point to and start uh, like I can right. just start linking in with some of the again there's a research center specifically on agriculture and one of interestingly one of our keynote speakers at this event that we're trying to do in February around this is from the Department of um, Food Agriculture and the mm. Marine turns out they are like one of the best people for adopting open source and government so cool. big, big gag theme in the whole yeah. thing yeah, I think there's a definitely an egalitarian and trust undercurrent there among farmers is like they trust what comes out of the university, um, sometimes more than like proprietary things, you know, um, so it's, yeah, it's a good collaboration. I'll, I'll Thank you. send some links your way in the chat. Thank you. Well, that's. That, that's that's lots to get to, to actually help me to begin with I like for me this is about like I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to kind of make this this case about linking open source into this innovation index these are the starter examples that I will use so I'll I'll, I'll just um say what I might do is actually create a, like a document where we can start putting in reference links to these like kind of an example of this is blah, 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 because that's that's what really makes it real for 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 me and then if i can work on gathering those in the background then i'll be able to share them with everyone as a, as a kind of a slide deck or whatever so folks can use them as well if it if, if it works um that'd be amazing 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm delighted to report that my first machine has completed its updates magically since we've been talking. So, so yay, I'm all set. <laughs> you hope, you hope. I hope, I hope it works now. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm going to grab these. Yeah, I think there's a lot to, to go on there. And I also think there's a lot of interesting, uh, we had an interesting conversation with OSI about how they're like, how can you actually make the value proposition and the economic arguments for the value of open source just in like the digital public good space? So yep. my husband's an economist and he's like, well, I can tell you how. <laughs> so. Well, what I'm what I'm about to go to speak at now is that open the Open Forum Academy Symposium that's happening in Harvard. So and they're very explicitly looking at the economic. They've got um not blind i think is um i don't know how to pronounce the second name so he's they're talking about that economic impact and trying to pull together these um these themes as well so i believe from talking to the organizers that they are building from this event for the next two days they're building a research agenda specifically on what you've just been talking about angela so i think the call's going to come out awesome that that's awesome because <laughs> nagel is the harvard guy and yes. we were just talking about how we were all going to get connected in and work on this together. We actually have a uh, people at that 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 conference. Excellent, excellent. Well, well, I too am interested, and I'm I'm like uh, like a uh, yeah. I'm I'm kind of thinking. Oh, I should have put it in the paper. Harvard was would have been a nice to go to in fall. You know, it's like kind of next year, next year. <laughs> yes, Boston is beautiful right now. So. Awesome. Well, I don't know if it's going to be in Boston next year, but we'll. We, I guess we'll find out soon enough. But um, yeah, it would be it would be a nice one to go to. All right, I'm going to have to hop off and uh, change machines, <laughs> but um, thank you all for for helping me with that. And I'll I'll share I'll do I'll write this up and share this back into the the university channel, um, for further further discussion for and to get gathered some of those examples as well. If I haven't got the the links, thank you for sharing the links here. I'm going to put those in as well, and uh, and uh, hopefully I can uh, just looking here just to make sure I didn't miss any of them. What's the TED talk about, David? Is is that anything? Should I should I include that? <laughs> no, that's totally separate. Okay, totally separate. Okay. Don't okay. waste students' work. It's a different <laughs> topic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good well, luck in your presentation, Claire. Thank you. It's, oh. it's just I'm I'm just in, I'm just chatting with someone, so that's that's an easy one for me. But um, but thank you. See you later. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. What are we supposed to accomplish? And I'm assuming this meeting is canceled next time because it's on thanksgiving so this meeting is um chaos takes the month of december off and next meeting is canceled so we uh, the next meeting is january at some point okay how so, did you know that you're just magical i mean know. they said that in the other meeting but i was just like how did people know this because their calendar has the meetings oh well then i could be wrong um, no, I think you're right, given what we learned in the last meeting. But I was like, how do people know that? Because your calendar, their calendar has meetings throughout December and November. Um, I thought they maybe canceled it. Maybe they haven't. I don't know. I could I could be completely wrong about this. I know chaos has December off, um, but they 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 might be not doing that for us. Um, like, you know, like for the last meeting, they said. I could we could have our SDG meeting in December. Um, so I don't know. I I'm kind of hoping. <laughs> oh no, I'm being recorded. Sorry. I would never say anything about not wanting to come to another meeting. <laughs> no, I gotta it's I was talking to my colleagues and I was like, the next this week and next week, it's like everyone was like, I have to get the event done before the end of the year. And so <laughs> I'm going to like 75 events between now and, and I still I'm learning the academic calendar because this is my I haven't even been the first full year I started December 4th <laughs> so I'm like whoa everybody goes crazy in the fall and like everything it's like gotta go gotta go and, and, and I guess nobody's gonna do any work after Thanksgiving is what I'm anticipating <laughs> I think that's when sort of like the wrap up meetings happen. And there are some big grant deadlines in kind of the February ish timeframe. And people know that like between the last week of December and sort of like 
the second week of January, nothing happens. So we do have like planning meetings and stuff like that, but the crush of activity is certainly now. I think it's partially because Thanksgiving is so late this year. There, that doesn't feel like there's any time when you come back to meet with people. Mm. Yeah. So. Anyway. Right. Um, Allison, are we launched our survey? Um, it's the same as yours. We have forty people responded. I'm very disappointed. I have a strategy from my librarian about how to like just sit in the library and give out. She said full size candy bars is the only way. If you give out miniatures, people won't do the survey. But full size candy bars, and she's offered to <laughs> set me up with a box. But of hey, congrats on doing that. Bars. Yeah, it's great. Oh yeah, no, thank you. We couldn't have done it without you. I mean, literally, we used all of your documentation and awesome. yeah, I'm so grateful. Um, and no, we're, great to hear. Um, I don't know if you were aware, we're presenting at the CNI conference, which is in DC. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm doing part of the presentation. And all I'm going to talk about is all the great things that um, <laughs> the other OSPOs have done that I've gotten to use. <laughs> so <laughs> UT Austin, like, hey, that's what it's all about. Yeah. This is the oh. open source way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm, su I mean, it's amazing. Like, it's, made me productive when I shouldn't be like it's I mean I'm able to just do so much community building work focusing on oh uh, event planning and <laughs> catering and all that stuff oh yeah. insane and um you know a lot of the other stuff is like other people have done and I can just kind of pick up those pieces and apply them it's still a lot of work but it's not nearly as much as like you did a lot of research to figure out what questions to ask. And we, I love all your questions. So we just took them all. And that way it also, we can aggregate, you know, the surveys. Um, yes. Really mm -hmm. down the road. So thank you for doing all that and for sharing it. That was brilliant. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I, it, it was a, a great project. I hope you get some good responses, some good data with your candy bars. <laughs> so Our survey good. center hands out $2 bills. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah. that's what they do at Carnegie Mellon too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need to do that. I so we did this bidding one when I was there as a student, and it was you won all kinds of cash. Actually, there they had cash associated with this thing. And I was like, all I really want is a T-shirt that says Carnegie Mellon Lab Rat. <laughs> that's what it would have done it for me. <laughs> but the two dollar bills are very popular. Does anybody else have anything else they want to talk about? I hope you get better. Yeah. I'm on all, I got all the meds right now. So I finally, <laughs> I'm one of these, like, my body will heal itself. That's what I always do. And my wife just looks at me like I'm crazy. And <coughs> today I went to urgent care and they're like yeah. four different things. They're like a spray and a pill and some other things. I'm like, oh, geez, okay. Well, you don't want walking pneumonia, and that's what that will turn into mm -hmm. if you don't do the No, I don't want that. And... They said I don't have pneumonia. They said my lungs seem good, but bronchitis is, I, can, I don't even know what it is, but it, it sounds bad. <laughs> well, your bronchial tubes are inflamed in your lungs, so you okay. might not have the wetness yet, but that's where it will go next. So okay. it, pneumonia is, my sister does this every year, gets pneumonia after she doesn't treat her bronchitis. Yeah, and we did. Um, I was feeling rotten Thursday and Friday, and then we went camping, and it was super cold, and oh, no. we didn't have like a winter setup. So I was just like, cold at night, and and then I woke up Sunday, and I was so miserable. Uh, yeah, it's all right. Thanks for your well wishes. Yes, get better. And then enjoy an actual break for Thanksgiving. Yes. <laughs> yes. That will be good. And I'll wrap up my blanket and watch some Netflix later. Perfect. <laughs> I watched The Perfect Couple. It's actually really good. It's got Nicole Kidman in it. Oh. Know it, but it's a murder mystery. It's really oh. good. Okay. <laughs> I'm watching something I never watched, which is like a animated thing. It's called Arcane. Oh yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like the animation's really cool. The animation's really cool, and yeah, yeah. it's a little bit violent and a little bit oh. like it's it's a, if you know League of Legends, the League of Legends TV show. Um, I don't. 
it, it reminds me of Expanse. I feel like maybe mm -hmm. or, or some of the some of the actors are the same. And then, but it's yeah, it's it's got me captured. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's a French studio, and they like hand painted digitally the the animation, and it's really incredible. There's like a behind the scenes video about it online. Um, but yeah, I, I really I watched it because my husband is a League of Legends enthusiast. <laughs> Yeah. And I actually just really liked it for the story. And yeah. yeah, you don't have to play League of Legends to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. I don't know League of Legends, but I, I really like the story. It's really yeah. good. Appropriate for my eight year old? No. Yeah, it's kind of okay. violent. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of slow motion punching scenes, and there's definitely <laughs> death. Um, okay. Yeah, no. It's dark, but. Okay. The wild robot. There you go. That's what you're. That's so good. Yeah, it really <laughs> is. You're already yeah. on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Moana two is coming out. I can't. That oh, is going to yeah. be my daughter's so first excited. movie. Yeah. Do you know when it actually comes out? The twenty seventh. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I have the my... next, next weekend. I'm on my own. My wife is going to a music conference for five days. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I was you like, in moved. Washington, D.C. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You got museums out the wazoo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know I'm going to parent. Like, oh. <laughs> it's going to be super fun. You're going to love it. It's always it intimidating good. because they're balls of energy, but you're going to love it. Yeah. I'm going to be tested. That's all right. There's that no was all recorded too. Solve. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows I'm a bad parent and a bad worker. Oh my gosh. All right. I totally know that about you. <laughs> you got from all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anything else? Any any other big wins or anything anyone wants to share? We get through the next two weeks, it'll be a big win. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh god. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. You too. See you Talk to you soon. Later. See you. Feel better. Thanks. Bye. Bye.